from Hong Kong, Chicago and the city of Stoke-on-Trent. This is the Classic Lenses Podcast. Hello and welcome to episode 102. My name is Simon Forster and I'm joined by Johnny Sisson and Perry G. Hello, Johnny. Good morning. You you don't sound good, Perry. <coughs> not, not in particular, no. <laughs> no. So you're a bit, you're a bit poorly at the moment. Uh, yeah, yeah, a bit. I, I have a sinus infection, so... I'm a little nasally today, folks. Sorry. Well, we'll uh, we'll, we'll we'll try and get through. I'm, I imagine Perry, you're you're fighting fit, are you? Oh, I'm okay. I'm recovering from a mild bout of food poisoning, which I suspect came from a dodgy Vietnamese restaurant yesterday. But uh, it's not too bad. Yeah. So so I'm I'm. It seems like I'm the healthy one this week. Um, <laughs> So uh, okay, let's let's move things on. Uh, this week uh, it's just the three of us again. Um, that's largely because we didn't finish off the emails from last week, so we want to we want to get those done. Plus, we've got a, a few things we want to talk about in in general. So um, I'm going to hand it over to Perry because you've been busy because you've you've got at least one new acquisition. I do. I have I have a couple of new lenses, uh, intentional and unintentional. So. In Hong Kong, as I think I mentioned the first time I came on as a guest to talk about the market here, when good deals pop up, you really have to jump on them. Uh, and my my girlfriend totally enables this mentality because I'm always hesitant when I see something that I want, but it's not like super cheap. Uh, and she just says, if it's a good deal, just go buy it because you're going to miss out otherwise. So I go, OK, she says it's OK, so I'm going to do it. Uh, so I was sitting on a bus on Wednesday night. And one of the local shops here posts a listing online uh, that I was just browsing at the time. And they had listed a Contax G 35 millimeter F2 planar, but converted to M mount in a black paint barrel uh, that very closely resembles the Sumicron Spherical 35. So, you know, for a long time, as far as 35 len- uh, millimeter lenses go, I, I have the ZM 3528 Biogon, which I think is the greatest lens ever. Uh, I have the 35 1.4 Distagon, which is fantastic for low light, but it's too big for sort of everyday use. And I really wanted an F2, but the, the ZM is too big. So I should say I wanted another F2. So I've actually been looking for a uh, conversion. And I know people like uh, Miyazaki MS Optics in Japan does conversions of these Contax G lenses but I'm not a fan of the way that they look. So when this one popped up, I saw it and I looked at it for a minute and thought, oh my God, I have to have this. <laughs> um, and so I messaged him to reserve it. And when I went to get it the next day, he told me that within five minutes of me messaging, uh, five other people had basically WhatsApped him or messaged him asking to reserve this lens. Uh, because it was done, I think, by a master in Taiwan, and I've only ever seen one other conversion of this style, which was in Taiwan. Uh, the, the distance scale was yellow instead of white, so I know they're not the exact same lens. But, oh my goodness, guys, it, it's, this, this is so nice, this lens. When, when I saw the picture of it at first, it, 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 it looks very reminiscent of a, of a black Jupiter 8. I mean, is it... It can't uh, be quite the same as that. It's not a rebodied no. Jupiter 8, is it? No, it, it is not rebodied. I think it is custom made. If you hold it in your hands, it is made of brass. Uh, it has a black paint finish, and the hood is also black paint. It's heavy as hell for its size. If, you, if you've ever held a 35 millimeter Sumicron spherical in black paint finish, it's, it's almost identical in like general vibe. So I, I would compare it much more to that than a Jupiter Eight. It's not like it's not rehoused in a, a Soviet lens uh, helicoid, which is one of the more common ways you'll see these conversions done. I mean, to 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 be fair, I mean it it doesn't sound like I'm I'm <laughs> doing it any favors by describing it that way. But that was it. It, it wasn't actually a. Uh, I wasn't trying to do it down with with uh, with that comparison. But I think that's actually quite a nice looking lens. But it, it just mm-hmm. so is it a case of it's it's effectively like a larger version of a of a of an LTM Jupiter eight. So, I mean, that's that's just the impression that I got from the photo. No, no. At at, at I mean, I guess there's no way for 
me to let you feel the lens uh, from across the continents. Um, <laughs> well, there is. It's the, it's called the post office, but um, <laughs> no, you're, having, you're having fun with it at the moment, aren't you? So, yeah. yeah, I'm not sending this one over to you. Um, <laughs> no, no, you know the uh, the 50 millimeter Simulux spherical. I know of it. Oh, so the 50 mil. Sorry. Oh, yes, yes, yeah. I do. Yes, it feels like that, but oh, smaller. That's cool. Yeah, it's it's super nice. I mean. The thing with these conversions is a lot of the times they're pretty half-assed. Um, and I don't know. I, I've actually been waiting for something like this to pop up for ages. It was a really good deal, less than, I would say, a third the price of a Sumicron. Um, and, y- you know, the interesting thing about this lens is people say it's the worst lens, uh, worst prime in the Contact G system. And the optical layout is very, very similar to the version for uh, 35 Sumicron, which I also have, but my girlfriend won't let me use it when we go out shooting together because she insists on hogging that lens. So I, I compared, this is really nerdy, but I, I compared the MTF charts of the two and they're largely similar, but on the edges, the Zeiss falls off quite dramatically. Uh, whereas the Sumicron, it still falls off, but not to the same degree. And I gotta say, I can, like, this is one of the first times where I've seen two lenses side by side and I can really see what the MTF chart is telling me very, very clearly. Because this lens in the center is very nice. It's got that sort of Zeiss uh, look to it, which I like very much. But the edges wide open are crap, for for lack of a better term, which is not a problem with street photography uh, because I'm usually at F8 anyway. But it's very noticeable if you put them side by side. Yeah, I mean, we, we've we've obviously had a chat about this um, initially and uh, and. Yeah, this this business about it being the 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 almost like a weak link in the in the range. Um, I think you, it's it's that yeah, a weak link in a in a in a Zeiss range is not necessarily that much of a weak link. Um, but the the other side of it is, I think one of the other reasons why I, th- I think that lens isn't as popular as as perhaps it, it it could be is just the 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 way that the Contax G range. Um, the spread of the lens the in lenses in terms of focal length it, yeah the 35 mil is a bit of an oddball in that but simply because the, the the standard lens if you like the normal lens is a 45 mil yeah. and it's well recognized as being one of the best lenses out there it's just a, a, a truly superb lens and so 30, 45 mil and to 35 mil there's not a yeah, it's, it's there isn't that much of a difference, is there? Really, you for, yep. in most cases you can move with your feet and just get more or less the same kind of shot. So I think, I mean, certainly when I um, borrowed uh, Jeremy North's uh, outfit um, when I went on a, a trip to Edinburgh, I didn't take the thirty-five, or I did. Or perhaps I actually no, I did take the thirty-five because it was all in a box, so everything came with me. Um, but it, it stayed in the box, whereas the twenty-eight got used, and, and the twenty-one, and the and the forty-five, but not. But I, I just didn't feel I at any point did I ever actually want or need the thirty-five. Yeah, uh, I, I think you're right about it being part of a kit because you know the forty-five is legendary, right? And so if you're going to carry a twenty-eight and a forty-five then 35 is close enough to both of those that it, it seems unnecessary. Yeah. Whereas if you are just going to carry one lens, or especially using it on a Leica where the frame lines you know, make a big difference, um, it, to me, it works better on converted to Leica for precisely that reason. Like it's an individual lens rather than a system yes. lens. Yeah. yeah. I'm sure I could be very, very happy with it if that was the only lens I would use. And 35mm is a, is a great focal lens. I, I really like 35mm. Um, so it, it would it would make sense, but it is it's just yeah, it is a bit of a Cinderella lens, really. Yeah, I, I mean, I think the whole weakest uh, in the lineup. I think what I said to you was it's like saying it's the weakest player in Liverpool starting eleven. Yeah, right. It's it's still an outstanding lens, and I I enjoy it very much. And it does something very important. Which uh, half shout out to Mister Mike Epstein um, slash middle fingers to him. Because he has he has gotten in my head that every lens that I have and like to use should be part of a kit of lenses that share the same filter size. Because this is something that he obsesses over because uh, he shoots black and white film you know, 99% of the time. So he likes to carry kits around that 
have uniform filter sizes, which is why he loves the Pentax K system so much. Oh, sorry, the Pentax M42 system so much. Um, but is a little bit frustrated with his choices for uh, his Leica M3 and Zeiss Leica ZM. So this Contax has a 46 millimeter filter, uh, which pairs it really nicely with some of the 50s that I have, but not so nice with the longer and wider lenses out there. Yeah. It's one, of, it's one of the annoying things about shooting film because I do carry just filters of different sizes and it makes so much more sense to standardize them. So shout out to Pentax and Nikon, right? Because they were pretty much the only companies that made a very, very conscious choice to do that, right? Uh, uh, Olympus too. And, and mm. Contax with Carl Zars. And Minolta. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> pretty, much, pretty much all of them, yeah. <laughs> so shout out to everyone except Leica. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like it kind of did i mean they, they have, really they have sets right they have yeah and they kind of standardized on somewhat on 39 i guess Ish. but yeah they have yeah so that's that's very helpful and it's uh i know johnny you talked about this a whole bunch but it is better than carrying loads and loads of different filters around which i do and it's, it's a very really stupid yeah uh, solution yeah yeah the series thing is a good solution. Yeah. So uh, anyway, apart from that lens, uh, which I am enjoying very, very much, um, when I was at the shop, he, the shopkeeper managed to talk me into buying. Uh, well, no, I, I decided I wanted one of the other lenses on his shelf, and he talked me into buying another one um, because on his shelf was a uh, Carl Zeiss Jena fifty one point four Biotar. Uh, converted to like an M mount with rangefinder coupling down to three feet. And I saw, I had seen one of these at his shop for a staggeringly good price. We're talking like less than half the price of what the non converted ones are going for on eBay. Um, so I missed out on that many, many months ago. And here there was another one just sitting on the shelf. And so I tested it out and decided I had to get this. Uh, and then he talked me into another lens that went into fueling my C-mount gas, which is the Taylor Taylor Hobson Cook Ivotal 1-inch F1.4 and a stigment. Biotar first. I think we've yeah, I think we've got to talk about the Biotar, haven't we? I've, I've, so that <laughs> that am I right in thinking that's um, that was never meant to be a stills lens? That's correct. Uh, it was originally designed for um, oh, what's that camera called? It starts with P. Uh, it's a sixty. The Penta Pentaflex AK sixteen, uh, and I'm pretty sure the AK does not stand for um, like Kalashnikov. <laughs> but uh, it, it so I think it was designed for a sixteen millimeter uh, film, like cinema body. But uh, it, it seems like they made a couple natively in either M thirty nine or M forty two. Uh, sort of, you know, factory converted after the fact, as, as Zeiss did with a lot of their lenses. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's an interesting it's an interesting lens. Um, the the bokeh is swirly. Uh, Let's just rewind a little bit onto the yes. You know, stay with the the technical side. So, uh, okay, sixteen millimeter film. Yes, yet you're using it on full frame. Yes. So what what I found using cine lenses uh, that are designed for smaller formats on digital cameras or whatever is from the equivalent of around 50 millimeters up, they will typically cover uh, or badly cover a larger format. So, you know, 50 millimeter C-mount lenses or 35 equivalent will more or less cover, for the most part, APS-C. Uh, the contact Yashica 50 millimeter lenses will more or less cover GFX. Um, for example, so this this one it it does cover full frame badly. Uh, the at infinity you get some mechanical vignetting, but very very little. So it's kind of in the same way that like the Olympus uh, thirty eight one point eight pen f lens does cover full frame hmm. just badly, and you can see it because in its rendering you get a kind of APS C sized like bokeh bubble um, of swirly bokeh in the middle, and anything beyond that flattens out. So it's a very interesting. Uh, what do you call that? Plane of focus. Yeah. And right. when you when you say covering covering full frame badly, of course we actually mean it, it covers it really really well for our purposes. 
yes, uh, yes. I mean, the okay. So apart from the little bit of mechanical vignetting, here's the thing, right? This lens, I I wanted to see that whether it was a one trick pony because literally every picture I've seen with this lens is just like pretty woman with swirly bokeh behind them, and I totally did that. I spent, you know, I went out shooting at night with my buddy Anthony who switched to digital and gave me loads of crap for still shooting film. And now he switched back to film and I went out with three digital cameras while he shot with CineStill on his Canon 1V and Zeiss Otis 55.14. Uh, so he gave me tons of crap because that night all I was doing was making bokeh out of this lens. Um, and he was like, is this what you have been reduced to, Perry? <laughs> so so I, I wanted to see that it, it wasn't just a one-trick pony. Um, and with M-mount coupling, it it can be shot on a rangefinder. And, you know, I shot a couple of mixed light scenes on my Sony uh, sort of at a nighttime food market. And it it does do a couple of things that I really like in cine lenses, um, especially when you have, like, light sources and then they kind of they kind of glow into the air i don't know if that makes sense there's this sort of soft diffusive glow yeah. uh, that a lot of cine lenses render with light sources and this one this lens totally does that i think it's absolutely beautiful um so maybe it's a two-trick pony but apparently it's legendary and ricardo was messaging me non-stop going like oh my god i want it i want it i want it well i i, I certainly enjoyed um the the pictures that you you shared with us and uh, there was one there was one shot of a microphone um which uh, uh like an old really old fashioned stainless steel uh micro- was it a microphone i assume it yeah was. that's the the microphone i use to record the podcast it's oh, right, right okay. in front of my mouth right now that's really cool um so uh, yeah and it was it was a really really nice shot and then you posted another photograph and it was equally nice in a different kind of way. The bokeh was wasn't as as obvious, but it was still present. Um, uh-huh. but there was a little. I think there was well, there was more in focus, and I, and it defined the microphone better, and it, I think it stood out better. And I think overall, it was a more pleasing shot. And yeah. uh, that was with your Taylor Taylor Hobson, wasn't it? Correct. Uh, so let me get onto that in one second. Uh, I, there's one final thought that I just want to throw out about this biotar. Um, its handling is clearly designed for something other than normal shooting because you know how a lot of rangefinder lenses have a focus tab? Mm-hmm. This thing has a cutaway focus tab, but it's not a focus tab. It's an aperture tab. And I accidentally turn that thing all the time because it's it's in the place where a focus tab should be. So still wrapping my head around the handling. But uh, yes, on that other shot of the uh, microphone, so, you know, obviously these two lenses were like giant sex bombs. And the the Taylor Hobson was something that the shopkeeper just talked me into buying as a, as a relatively affordable add-on. Um, these lenses are way more expensive on eBay than they are in Hong Kong. I, I have no idea why. But the prices on eBay are like four or five, sometimes six times higher than what I, I got them for. Um, so this lens is so nice, man. It's so nice. Uh, I've been messing around with it. Um, and it has this sort of smooth sharpness. That's absolutely beautiful. Uh, it covers, it'll cover micro four thirds, but I have to either crop square or crop pano to use it on a Fuji, but it's built like a tank. It's absolutely beautiful. And I have a theory and this might, you know, irritate Biotar fans out there, but that extreme swirliness, I, th- I think you will get with, any lens that is designed for that 16 millimeter format. So my theory is if you take, you know, like a woolen sack, 50 millimeter C-mount lens, if you take a Taylor Hobson, a Dalmeyer, a Kern, whatever, if you take any 50 millimeter uh, cine lens for that's designed for 16 millimeter film, I think you will get that crazy swirl that this Biotar seems renowned for. Um, but I think the overall rendering of the, uh, Taylor Hobson is much, much, much nicer. And I now want one uh, that's 50 millimeters so that it can cover at least APS-C fully. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think you might have, might have something there. I mean, certainly the, uh, the, the Olympus we mentioned earlier, the 38 1.8, that, that does funky things at the edges. And I've got a, I think it's actually for 12 millimeter, I think the format, um, a, a Delmeyer uh-huh. lens. And that does just, very much the same thing only just covers micro four thirds 
and that um, that that goes that goes really really funky in the corners as well. So yeah, you know, it, it could be just what that's what's going on at the edges of uh, of, of these lenses. That's a, perhaps another question for uh, Jason Lane when we get him back. Yeah, yeah, totally. But I mean, it just it just looks like uncorrected field curvature, you know. Um, and if you the, the the reason I say this is because I have messed around with the Taylor Hobson up close, and it. It doesn't have a sim- it doesn't have a similar render- rendering, but it has a similar degree of swirl on APS-C. So my theory is, if you it's not just a theory. I spent time looking this up on Flickr and Instagram. If you take any fifty millimeter C mount, you get you'll get swirl um, to different degrees of insanity. Mm-hmm. Yeah, makes so, sense. That's that. But you know, with all of this in mind, I was out shooting with all of this stuff and playing with new toys is always fun. And I do like these lenses, especially the contacts. Uh, but I don't know. Overall, it was, it was more dicking around than actual shooting. Um, cause the, co- the, the biotar really, really does inspire dicking around. And these days, like Hong Kong has changed a little bit since the district council elections where there's kind of less overt over the top confrontations between cops and protesters, but the, the kind of undercurrent is still there and it's expanding into different forms of civil disobedience. And I, I found that I was trying to go back to some of my old style of street photography. Um, and with these new lenses, I thought, oh, these will inspire me to try to look for, you know, beautiful light and architecture and placing people and stuff. And I found that I just, I just couldn't do it because, you know, what I love about street photography is I think it reflects what I see the vibe of the place being. Um, so both like as my mentality and the sort of spirit of the place that and the people that I'm shooting. So that old style, it, it felt dishonest, you know, and it was only until I just randomly happened to stumble upon, um, well, I took a ferry to central in Hong Kong, got off the ferry and literally there was a bunch of people running towards the ferry. I was like, what the hell? And it turns out that about three minutes before I showed up, the cops had, tear gassed a an approved uh legal assembly and everyone was running away which which has pretty much been their modus operandi these days so i you know did the sensible thing and walked down to the ground zero and got right up to the cops and i happened to have a lights elmar nine centimeter f4 uh the black ltm one with me and i slapped that thing on and just came alive you know it was like yeah yeah this is this is what is actually the true ethos of Hong Kong and got right up close to the cops. And I don't know, it was just, it was just much more, it felt a lot more real in terms of what I was photographing, which I don't know what that says about me, but. Well, you, you were slightly further away as well. Uh, not really. I was actually, for a lot of the shots, I was as close as I would be with a 35 or a 28 millimeter lens. Um, and, I, and I had the, the contacts 35 and I took some shots with it because it was in my bag. But with a 90, I was using it for headshots because the, the cops right. were wearing these crazy helmets um, that made them look like not, not even stormtroopers, but, you know, just these crazy looking helmets. And they were reflecting everything around them. And I was just shooting close ups of their faces. And it was it was really fun. But not fun is not the right word. It felt very real. Yeah. 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 I, I mean, there's, there's, there's something about, you know, having the, the right equipment for the moment, isn't there? Uh huh. Yeah, I mean, you, because that line between doing the photography you actually want to do and what drives you to make photographs um, is, I think, it comes from a different place than the desire to dick around with lenses and and new gear. So I'm really glad that I had the G35 and the 90 Elmar, which let me shoot the way that I shoot when I'm actually doing photography. Uh, because there's no way I was going to use the Biotar and make like swirly bokeh of riot police. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah, I it. I mean, I had a, a, a sort of related kind of experience on uh, yesterday. Um, I went to a local park, and yeah, it was um, it was a foggy day, and uh, the previous week I'd been out with uh, large format and the Aero Ektar, and I, I shot a couple of rocks, uh, badly focused rocks, um, but I really enjoyed the experience and I enjoyed the look. And uh, and you you see photographs that are taken in the fog, and, and they can be really good because they can um, 
it helps isolate your subject far better, um, especially if you're some in, in a place where there are interesting things and there's also busy backgrounds as well mm -hmm. so that you yeah the things get lost um it's great if you can isolate a tree and stuff like that and uh um so i, w I went out and, and and there was uh the you know the usual debate as well you know what kit am i going to bring with me and i decided this wasn't a day to shoot film that was that was my first thought um largely because i was thinking well what lenses do i want to take and the first lens I wanted to take, um, not because I wanted to, but I felt that, that I should, uh, was a, an Industar 22, uh, which is mm. a collapsible uh, Soviet lens, uh, five centimetre, because it's, a, it's an old one. This was, this was a 1961 uh, F3.5. And I think it's, it's a, although it's a Tessar, I think it's actually a, it's an Elmar uh, derivative, I think. Would you know if that's the case or not with those? Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm pretty sure the Indostar 22 is an Elmar uh, copy. Yeah, yeah. And as we, as we discussed a couple of weeks ago, um, Elmars and Tessars are very, very closely related. The only real difference is the position of the the uh, the iris, I believe. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so yeah. So uh, this this I, I took this lens out. Uh, because I had it for sale on on my eBay shop, and I thought, well, let's let's just give it a go. And you know, it's small, and I and I thought, okay, I'm not going to shoot film. I'm going to put it onto my onto my Sony, and I can I'll just take another lens with me and just see see how I get on. In fact, actually, I took my Horizon with me just in case, but I didn't use that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I got out there, and immediately. I could see that it was an interesting environment to be uh, to be out uh, with the, with the camera, um, and the lens was giving me exactly uh, what I expected it to. Uh, just a pretty regular fifty millimeter image uh, without mm -hmm. any great um, weird things going on, and and that sort of put me in the place of mm, okay. Um, I better take normal shots uh, because that's that's what this lens does, and that was so that was pretty much what I did, and I and I it, it tuned my head into taking that that kind of photography, and I and uh, I think I took probably about three three or four photos with it, and uh, I've shared two of those um, today in the uh, in the podcast Facebook group, uh, mm -hmm. one, of, one of which is a bridge over a canal, and then there's another photograph of a. A lamp post which is actually in the photo um on the bridge itself and uh and they've you know i'm, I'm very happy with with both shots and yeah, i really like the bridge shot the timing of the woman with her dog is wonderful yes yeah it was uh i saw um actually it was it was a man by the way but yeah you can't really tell oh uh, yeah yeah <laughs> just in case he's listening um and uh <laughs> Uh, so uh, I, I saw I saw the guy um, coming up the steps uh, with with a dog. I was thinking, oh, here you go. This 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 my this my opportunity. And because normally I try and wait for nobody to be there, of course, uh, because I don't do street shooting. And um, well, this time I thought, no, no, I'm going to be really brave. And so I looked the other way and yeah. uh, got my timing right. And then bang, uh, just took took the shot. And uh, um, and and there it was. And it and it worked out uh, that it was in the right place. There was a, a couple. So on the right hand side of the bridge where I'm thinking they weren't really doing anything particularly interesting, but you know, they were there and that was just mm -hmm. how it was. Um, but the, 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 the shots just, it's just a really, really nice shot. And, yeah. um, and it's, you can just see how you would use that lens for doing documentary shooting and, um, you know, uh, street photography and it was fine. And, and it, it did, did exactly what I was trying to do it at that moment. And so having managed to like get a, what would potentially a couple of decent shots under my belt, I thought, right, that's it. Now I'm going to put the other lens on and have some fun. And the other lens I brought with me was my, uh, Lomography new pets, Vel 58, uh, 1.9 uh. and the world changed. And mm -hmm. as soon as I put it onto the camera, I, you know, my, my mindset was just completely different um, because it, it's almost a case of well, it doesn't matter what you do with it. If you point it in a direction, it's going to give you something interesting. It might not be a great, a well-composed image, but it's just got interesting things. It's like, it's like shooting on LSD, if that's what it's like. Mm -hmm. And... I well, not that I know, but yes. No. And so, so the, it was, it was, I was going to say, Johnny's just unmuted himself there. 
<laughs> it was an accident. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Uh, um, so, um, so putting putting the Petsvel on uh, just completely changed my attitude, and it completely changed the kind of shots that I was wanting to take because before I was I was largely interested in taking overall scenes although the the lamppost shot is of a lamppost and it's got a bit of background and it's got a bit of sun coming through the fog and and stuff stuff like that um but both of those shots were shots that were appropriate for that lens and they would not have worked as well if I'd taken those shots with the Petzval. They just would have been just way too funky and there would have been the effect that, that the lens would give would just distract from what the photograph was about. And so walking around with the Petzval after, I then started, you know, looking at details or just looking at things I could actually frame that I know that the, in the centre is going to be more or less normal and then it would just go completely nuts around the edges. And, and and that was where I, I, yeah, I just started to compose in that way. And I and it was looking for detail instead of looking for scenes as a whole. And mm -hmm. uh, I just really enjoyed that, that change in pace. Um, but more to the point, I just really enjoyed it, having that really funky lens instead of using something that was, you know, very vanilla. Yeah, I, it's interesting because, you know, you're talking about how the equipment you have uh, shapes what you look for and what you see when you're shooting. Um, whereas I'm talking more about how the your mindset and how you see the world shapes what you want to shoot and what you want to shoot with. But I think there's got to be some interplay between both, right? Which is why, you know, you hear so many people say when they hit a rut in photography, they go out and buy a new lens or, or try a lens that they haven't done so in a while because they can inspire you to see things that you or look at the world in a way that you wouldn't otherwise do with your normal day-to-day -day equipment. Yeah. No, that's, that's exactly it. And that's exactly what's, what happened with me. And the other, the other part of this was, as I said earlier on, I decided this was not a day for shooting film. Mm -hmm. And that was just completely untrue. Um, I look back at the, the two photographs I've just been talking about that I took with the Industar would have been absolutely great on film. If I'd used the right film, I'm, I'm sure they would have produced very similar shots, and I think they would have actually had a bit more, a, a bit more to them. Uh, whereas the uh, the Petzval shots, I'm not entirely sure being on film would have actually added anything to those. But the other side to this, it was just the, the sheer convenience of shooting digital instead of working out well which camera have I got the lenses to go with that camera what film am I going to use have I got the right film for for that and there was just too many variables. Um, for, for me to like, because I just made a decision, let's go out, and, and 10 minutes later we, we were out. Whereas with digital, you've just got all of those options after the event. And it's it's actually been a while since I've actually shot, uh, gone out and actually shot specifically to shoot digital. And I thought, you know, mm -hmm. it's doing something different. And, um, and it was, it was what was interesting was just how much I really enjoyed it because I've been on this film. Um, buzz for for quite a while, and uh, to the detriment of shooting digital. Yet I've I've really really enjoyed the the freedom, yeah, uh, that it gave me by shooting digital. Yeah, totally. I mean, it the Industar that you brought is is you know it's a good lens. I think it's it's sharper than the lights. But um, if you had shot this on film, I think you probably would have need, needed like a blue filter to accentuate the foggy effect. Is that right? The blue filter makes the fog more foggy. Yeah. 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 Um, whereas with digital, I guess, did you know that it was super foggy when you headed out? Yes, it was, it was absolutely the intention to, to, I went to this location knowing that the fog would, would be there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, I, I know what you mean though. Cause the other night when I went out with my digital cameras, it was, it was a lot of fun. You know, it was a different style of shooting. Um, I was using the Sony as a waist level finder, uh, which it does very poorly because it keeps switching the screen off. Yeah. Uh, but it's a different, you know, it's a different way of shooting that every once in a, every once in a while it, it is. Well, I, I had a lot of fun with it until my buddy Anthony posted his Cinecill shots of the same scene. And then I was like, oh, those look way better. <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, it's the, it's the same with, I guess, Johnny, with your weird Soviet super, super pano thing. 
Um, you can't see any other way when with any other camera, right? Not really. No, no, yeah. no, no. It's definitely one of those things that puts you in a different uh, gear altogether. I mean, I did, as I mentioned, I had that, I had my Ryzen with me. Um, mm. So, and I've, I've, you know, last year was the year of the Pano, and I've not used it this year because it was last year, of course. Um, but <laughs> uh, um, so I had three three tools available to me um, because I'm classing the two lenses as being two of the tools there, and I, I just there was there was nothing there that was making me wanting to use the uh, the the Ryzen at all. Um, so I guess yeah, that's that's largely down to what you've got in front of you. But sometimes you just it's it is how your mindset works, how you how you are in your head. Sometimes I think you need to be in a panorama mindset, and and sometimes you you're taking scenes and and. But I I actually really wanted to go out and use the Petzval because I hadn't actually used it for uh, for ages, um, and it is a bit of a one trick pony. Um, mm-hmm. Okay, it does a few tricks, but they're all re- it's it's always going to be funky. It doesn't matter what what you do. And the, and I took a shot of uh, some snowdrops with it, and you know it's that's sort of almost normal, but not but but not quite. Um, but it's just you couldn't use it all the time because it's just it's just it's just so in your face. Um, you, I feel like I have to ration it. Yeah, you know some some people obviously put them to amazing use, uh, but for general purpose. <laughs> You know, it's one of those lenses that you're not going to carry on a day-to-day basis because this look is very situation-specific. Yeah, yeah. But that's cool. You kind of inspired me to look at lenses that I haven't touched in ages to see if there are any that I want to go out and play with. Well, well that's, 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 that's good. Um, but it is that thing about, you know, if if you, you know, it's what those lenses are and, and what is the what is the camera that you have available for for those lenses, and sometimes you find yourself actually having to use a camera that you you don't want to use or you don't use very often, simply just to be able to use the lens. Hmm. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Can you? Hey, can you? Um. You can't collapse the Indostar into the Sony, right? Yeah, you can. Yeah. Oh, you can. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Okay, I didn't know that. Oh, that makes sense because the adapter is long enough that. When it's fully collapsed, it doesn't stick out that much. Yeah, that's it. the the, the only The only issues I think you get is when you're using a smaller sensor, uh, because the when you collapse the some of these lenses and the, you've got a smaller sensor, then the uh, the back of the lens housing when it collapses, it all hits the surround uh, right that goes yeah. around the, you know, around the perimeter of the sensor. Yeah. Which is also the same problem as you get with, like, say, using a, a Jupiter Twelve, uh, where the the rear element just goes so far back into the uh, the the lens. It's no problem on full frame, but again, you you do have problems with uh, with APS-C unless you're shooting on a warm day like Carl used to do. <laughs> it just used to bend the, uh, the the surround around the sensor. Um, but you you know, used them on a on micro four thirds. It's just just a non-starter, except for extreme macro. Okay, well, now let's head over to Chicago. Hello. <laughs> welcome, welcome back, Johnny. You, 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 you're not really with us today, are you? I, I'm trying. I'm just, you know, I've I've felt better than I do today. Mm. <laughs> I actually, I was actually, I missed work on Saturday. That's about the first time I've missed work in... I think, wow, since I was in the hospital, which was back in April, I think. So, so is, it, is this not is it, feeling is, too good? Is it is it malort related or something else? No, I mean, I you know, if anything, I, you know, usually when I'm sick like this, it's an excuse to uh, cure myself with hot toddies, which I can't do now. So I, you know, would usually I would polish off a butt like a bottle of whiskey and a, some tea to get healthy again and I can't do that. So I think that's why I, I don't, I, I feel worse than usual because I have a uh, whiskey free recovery going on. Yeah, whiskey free okay. illness. So yeah. Anyway, I'm just sort of snotty. I'm always snotty, but I'm literally snotty today. A little delirious. <laughs> So this is this hasn't got anything to do with your uh, your recent um, 
reemergence in, in, in the dark room, has it? Yes, actually, Simon, I'm glad you brought that up. This is what happens, folks, when you do dark room work. You get ill from the chemicals. From sitting over the vat of chemistry, you get ill like I did. So we'll just blame it on that. So no more printing for me. No, I'm kidding. Um, yes, I, I made contact prints. I turned my bathroom into a dark room and made contact prints uh, on, oh, I guess it was midweek. Um, and yeah, it worked out, worked out pretty well. I, I picked up some uh, print developer and some, um, I guess I got some fresh fix at the shop and uh, yeah, set my trays up and use one of my contact prints from my collection of contact print frames that I've had for years and years. And, uh, made some contact prints, which uh, I guess went surprisingly well, considering my photo paper. I don't know. I still don't know how old that photo paper is. The um, box looks pretty vintage. Yeah, but I think they they you I think they used that box design up until about the seventies. So still counts as pretty vintage. <laughs> yeah, it looks it looks yeah it looks pretty vintage. Well, sh- wait, see, you say that Perry, but when you grew up in the seventies, it doesn't seem that long ago. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah. Anyway, the paper the paper must have been fifty, sixty plus years old, um, and surprisingly was not fogged. Although it did have some. Uh, it wasn't it wasn't fogged as in just all grayed out, you know, but it did definitely have some uh some weirdness um that you can kind of see in the prints. Uh it, it, it it's sort of like fogging. It's like the ex- like the exposure on the paper just was not super even across the paper. Um but I I kind of like it. It kind of I feel like it kind of works with the with the images. So, so it wasn't really a problem. Are these the images that you took at the at the Air Force Museum and things like that? Uh, yeah, there, and then I, some others that I took elsewhere in California, and then some that I took here in Chicago too. Uh, so I'm just what wondering, you, I'm just wondering yeah. if they got like a, a, t- a bit of a timeless look. I mean, some of those shots did, um, apart from you know, if you got somebody something modern in there, but a lot of those shots did actually look like they could have been taken a long time ago. And I just wonder if that actually adds to the look uh, with when they printed. I, I think so because the paper, I mean, the paper definitely has a, a nostalgic quality to it because the tones are, I don't know. The tones are really interesting because they shift from like warm to cool. And then sometimes warm to cool within the same image. (laughs) So it's like that classic cold tone, uh, cold tone paper look, which I, that's why I don't like graded paper because it doesn't look like this. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it kind of, it kind of does work, I think with the subject matter a little bit. Did you, um, did you scan the negatives and, and compare them side by side? Like you said, you were going to, um, actually, you know, I haven't really done that, Perry. I probably should do that, but I, I don't know. I, I kind of like the, I kind of like the look of the prints and I think I'm only going to do uh six by nines this way and then scan them in rather than scan the negatives. Yeah. Um, and they do look really good. Yeah. But my scanner is kind of weird. I, I, it's got like the underside of the glass on my scanner. Yeah. Has like, it's, it's very hazy. Oh yes. Yes, that's quite common. Yeah, is it okay? Because I, it gives me yet another reason to hate flatbed scanners. But um, I don't know whether I need to like disassemble it to clean the glass or what. I haven't, I haven't reached that far in yet. Because I can, I can scan like the bottom half of the scanner isn't too bad. The top half mm. is really bad. So I'm just, I can kind of work around it. But I guess at some point, I'm probably going to need to basically disassemble the scanner and clean mm-hmm. the glass. Yeah. I mean, you don't know if it has any impact unless you just try the top, try the bottom, and see if you can. Tell well, it, it definitely shows up on the top. Oh, okay. So, so it's like properly hazed up. Yeah. It's properly yeah. shit. 
So I, mm. yeah. So I can only really use half the scanner bed. So yeah. Anyway, I have to. But I mean, they're just. It's a little six by nine. So, so your your bathroom dark room that you set up. Mm-hmm. Uh, so obviously you you use something black to cover the windows. Yes. Yeah. And we, yeah. What did you use for the light source? Uh, I used my LED light pad that I use for digitizing my film. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so I just put the contact frame, you know, face down on the light pad on the lowest power setting, which was actually still probably too high because it, I, it, my exposure times were literally like two seconds. And with this, with uh, this old contact printing paper, the whole idea behind the contact printing paper was it was very low speed <laughs> uh-huh. so you could you could just use a you know an electric light bulb to do your contact print exposures so um my light source is probably way brighter than it needs to be uh which i may have to do something about in the future but um yeah they call it gaslight film or gaslight paper because literally you know it you're tells talking, you you're crazy no, well, yeah, right, exactly. It tells you, it tells you, it tells you, it tells you you're crazy. Um, uh, but I mean, you could literally expose it by, you know, the gaslight in your, in your home, and develop it because it was, it was very um, low speed. Uh, we're talking, you know, turn of the century, into the like the twenties and thirties, mainly. Um, so did you have to do test strips or just no, two second blast in your No, nah, I just blasted it and see what happened. I think the first couple that I did on I had some other photo paper that I opened up that was not quite as old and it just blasted those like black. So I so I opened up this other box of the really old Agfa and I'm like, "Yeah, let's give this a try." And it surprisingly worked fine. All oh, it's it's very strange paper. Um you know how you guys both on darkroom stuff too. You know how like you, at least the way I do it is, you know, throw the throw the print into the developer upside down and mm-hmm. give a little shake and turn it over and the image starts coming up right away, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but this stuff, it takes a good minute and a half before you see any image at all. Oh and wow! Then, yeah, and then the blacks start to build up really, really quickly. So you have to kind of yank it like right at the right moment, right. To get it out of the developer, which I, so then I read a little bit about gaslight papers and apparently that was kind of how they worked. Um, because, you know, people were developing essentially by inspection. Um, so that's apparently part of the, uh, the, the deal with that type of paper. Which I'm so did, I, did sorry, go ahead. No, I was gonna say, so now I'm like I have gas for old paper now. Which <laughs> <So, laughs> is gas like terrible. gas. Gas like gas. Gas like paper gas. Yeah. So did you have a minute of panic as nothing showed up in the beginning? The uh time? no, I mean it was really faint. It just like it was really faint, like as if the exposure was drastically too little. Uh-huh. And I just kind of kept developing it, and it, and then once it hit about the two minute mark, the blacks really started to blacken up. So how can you tell when you're? Because when you're in there with a red light, I find that you know even stuff that's properly exposed just looks crazy black under the red light. And it's not until I'm done fixing and turn on the main light that you can see whether or not the tonality is correct. Uh, I I don't know. I just I. I guess like what is it like falling off a horse or something, Perry? It just uh, I you know decades of experience. Decades of experience, young Perry. Yeah. <laughs> you were in the dark room before I was born. <laughs> that's, right, that's right. Get off my lawn. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> if it makes you feel any better, Perry, I'm in the same boat as you. Um, and I'll, I'll look at these things and think, oh, that looks absolutely awful. Or it's if you pull it at the point where you think that looks right, it looks appalling by the time. <laughs> yeah, you right. It. Yeah, yeah, trust well, the test trip, right? Well, in, in in honesty, when these things hit the uh, fixer, they look almost completely black. Um, they have a lot of tonality in in the three quarter tone, so 
I, you know, I, I you can th- they didn't look like much at all until I turned the room light on. But I was just kind of kind of figuring that they were about right. Um, and after I saw the first couple, I guess they were about right. So, and I turned the power down on the uh, on the light source too, and that helped. So, yeah. Wait, when you say the three quarter tone, um, what are you referring to there? So the the basically the shoulder of the print. So the you know the fifty percent and above area areas of the print. Okay. The the basically the the dark you know the dark yeah 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 the dark Wait, is that a, is that a, is that a zone system term or I just sorry I just never heard that term before. Um. Well, there's a t- the toe and the shoulder are. If you look at a old, if you look at like a a density curve of film, a film, you know, any film from like back in the day, the way that film density curves would have been uh, plotted, you see that there's that that curve up from zero, right, where it curves up from zero density. And then there's that other curve where it curves off. It falls off to 100% black. And that those portions in the like 0 to 25 and then what, 75 to 100 are the toe and shoulder. Um, and I, yeah, I guess that's an old, just an old, uh, an old term, term for the uh, contrast curve. Okay. Simon, um, do you know what he's talk- referring to? Because I have no idea what you're talking about. I've got a I've got a vague idea, but I'm closer to your way of thinking, Perry. <laughs> I can I can put a uh, I can put a little diagram thingy. Yes, up or a link to a tutorial in the show notes. Okay, yeah, I could do that. Um, yeah. But yeah, no, that I don't know. That's just how I I. Uh, that's just how I grew up uh, understanding the uh, the. The, the gamma of uh, film stuff was toe and shoulder. So um, I don't, you know, actually that I think that is, uh, that does get discussed in zone system stuff. I don't know. I'll have to look in the Ansel Adams book. Um, so do you, do you also have sure. like kneecaps and elbows and stuff like that? Yeah. Just to head and shoulder. I think the kneecaps and the elbows would probably be like that. The 25% tone would be uh a kneecap maybe yeah it's, making, it's making more sense now and of course yeah yeah uh, well, I'm, I'm just i've just worked out where the sweet spot is of course but well, we won't go there on the on this family <laughs> <laughs> oh man so yeah so anyway i have these prints are incredibly curly uh so i have them been flattening for a week inside a cookbook um, mm. stacked underneath two or three other cookbooks. And they're still f- pretty curly, but they've, they've flattened out uh, fairly, fairly well. Um, I had no fancy drying setup to keep them flat as they were drying. So they're a little curly. And I think it's just the, probably the nature of the paper too. And, and what'd you do to make your red light red? Do you just use a piece of cellophane or something? No, that is a, a an old school um, darkroom light that, oh, I got, cool. okay. that I got at Central Camera. Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yep. That's just the old school legit darkroom light. Excellent. Well, yeah. Uh, well, well done for getting getting back in the darkroom. Uh, well, thank you. Yeah. yeah. That's good to hear. Um, yeah, I do want to do more of it now. So it was <laughs> it was a good it was a, it was a good experience. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah. I mean, I, I I remember when I first started with the the Six Towns Darkroom when I was first talking to Brian about relaunching it, if you like, and I had no interest in printing at all. I just wanted to do developing and uh, and then do do scanning. And he just he just looked at me knowingly, uh, like saying, "Well, you haven't gone in there and done any printing yet." I said, yeah, I've got no interest in that. And then I did some, and now I love it. It's just what it just gets under your skin. So uh, yeah, there you go. Right. Okay. Well, let's uh, let's move on then, and let's go to those. I think we got. Is it three emails? I think we've got. Uh, yeah. So we got we got three emails, and then I'm thinking then we'll probably wrap it up and let, give you an opportunity to go back to bed and uh, not have a hot toddy. <laughs> yeah. 
Perfect. Okay, b- b- before we go to emails, can can we take a quick break? I just got to run to the bathroom again. <laughs> <laughs> Barry, you're as bad as I need. I am today. You need your brooding bottle. It's food poisoning. Ah, oh, oh, no Barry. <laughs> Give me a moment. <laughs> All right. We are back. Oh, poor Perry. A brooding bottle wouldn't do him any good then. <laughs> he needs like brooding depends. I was going to say, is there is there, a, is there a, ter- a term for the other? Then again, no, it sounds like if he's got food poisoning, a bottle might actually do it for him. So. <laughs> oh, 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 poor Perry. Yeah. That's such a drag. Yeah. <laughs> That's the absolute worst. I feel bad for him. And here we are, Perry, making fun of you as you're spraying in the bathroom. <laughs> pe- pe- pebble dash in the back. I don't know if that actually means anything to, anything to you in the States. But, uh... <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> I think we make a decision not to talk about this kind of thing yet, ever again. Uh, but it looks like we've uh, broke. Oh gone no! Back this is this is always this is always a good thing to talk about. Yeah, <laughs> I think that you know once once you crack the seal, so to speak, <laughs> everybody's just going to expect to hear this at some point. Yeah, this this was like pretty much like the evolution of talking about the weather, which we don't do anymore. Um, we, no, we just right. do bodily we functions just talk now. About bodily functions. We can talk about my cookbook. I have uh, I have uh, my photos flattening in a copy of the Frugal Gourmets on our immigrant ancestors. Now, now, Simon, you being in the UK, I don't know if you know who the Frugal Gourmet is. No. Um, so this is a man named uh, Jeff Smith who was on a PBS cooking show in the – I guess it was the 80s. Um, and he was very popular, and he put out a whole bunch of series of books and whatnot. And uh, so, yeah, I have I have in this cookbook here. Um, but unfortunately, this 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 kind man was later accused of being a pederast. Um, and <laughs> he, I guess, he was already he didn't have a show anymore at that point. But it was you know kind of one of the and he, of course he was a he was a priest so <laughs> obviously he was a pederast um <laughs> but, but so he so he kind of is you know became persona non grata uh in the in the cooking world or at least the pbs affiliated public broadcasting system affiliated cooking world um so yeah i have but i have his book still and i have i have these prints Tucked right there into Jeff Smith's pocket, <laughs> flattening away. Excellent. Yeah, I don't even know. This is probably I don't even think probably half the people listening to this podcast even remember this. I mean, this was like the this his show was on and oh here we go nineteen eighty three to no, I just opened up the wiki on the frugal gourmet nineteen eighty three to nineteen ninety seven. Uh, what, what was his name again? Jeff Smith. Oh right, okay. Yeah, so it was over in the in the UK back in in those days. Maybe it was uh, certainly in the seventies. We used to have the Galloping Gourmet. Oh yeah, I've heard of the Galloping Gourmet. Yeah. Oh, he was he was great. I, uh, I can. I mean, I was way too way too young for to understand what the kind of stuff he was doing. But it was just like an entertaining show where he would just uh, cook at cook at pace uh, while talking to guests and things like that. Yeah, this is this is somewhat similar. Yeah, yeah. I think Graham Kerr. I think his name was. The Galloping Gourmet. So uh, that yeah. sounds familiar. Yes, yeah. the, the, I do believe I've seen I've seen that. Yeah, it's, it's quite quite incredible. The completely useless pieces of information you can drag from <laughs> the depths of your memory just when you when you need to fill time when Perry goes off to the toilet. Yeah, exactly. That, well, that's what happens when you're old. <laughs> your your brain is filled with useless, you know, things. You know, details about cooking show pederasts and such i you know i don't know so tra- traditionally on this podcast we've usually just had a break and then then we just stop and then we'll talk about this kind of stuff and right. off, off off air but uh yeah i think this this time it's it's gonna go out there in all its glory i think yeah especially because now um uh, keen keen listeners will have started their stopwatch and they're knowing exactly how long Perry is in the bathroom for, which is even better. And they're just wondering how it's going in there for Perry now, because we're doing it in real time. Speaking of which, 
Have you have you seen the film that 1970 film? Oh shit, film? shit. I was on mute and I was trying to talk to you guys while you were talking about all that old person stuff. Now, well, you were on now, mute in the in the bathroom, Perry. No, I've been here for a couple minutes being like, why are you guys talking about old people stuff? Can we continue as you were talking about <laughs> Jeff Smith and all these things? And then Johnny starts talking about leaving this in the podcast, and I'm like, what the hell? I'm ready to go. And then I realized I was on mute. So I heard the last like few minutes of your conversation and just figured you were ignoring me because you guys were talking about old people things <laughs> oh it was all about you yeah it was all about perry yeah. oh i heard it this jeff smith crap that's not my name yeah lies, <laughs> lies. i have the evidence to take. yeah there was there was stuff before that as well perry so yeah there was there too. Um, some of that yeah. okay so uh perry perry's back um, <laughs> and, um <laughs> i've been back yeah, so uh, was there anything else uh, you wanted to uh, get off your chest or anything like that before we head over to these emails? Well, not my chest. No. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything else that needs to be evacuated? <laughs> right, so uh, let's let's do emails because uh, we got halfway through the – well, probably slightly more than halfway through the emails last week and uh, – Paul Hannah has been waiting for an answer for an extra one because oh, we almost yeah. got to her email and we uh, almost we did. All right. Uh, am I going to attempt to read this? <laughs> yeah, and if if you if you okay. can't manage, then uh, then Perry will bravely take take over. <laughs> okay, I'll give it a go. So Hannah wrote us on uh, January third, which is about ten days ago, I guess, a little more. Hanna says, hello, CLP. I love your show, though I'm not really a gear person. I bought one lens last year, the Nikkor 105 in LTM mount. I mostly shoot a Canon P and one film, Roly RPX 400. Anyway, I'm writing because I was given an OM2N for Christmas. And it's actually been really nice having aperture priority in some situations. Before, I would always use point and shoots for the times where mechanical meterless camera was too slow, for example, playing with my two-year-old son. Uh, sometimes getting him in focus is hard enough by itself without juggling light meters and turning shutter speed dials. Uh, I like the aperture control that an SLR gives me with just the right amount of automation. I'm curious what wide-angle lenses in OM mount get your approval. I know Perry likes the 21 uh, the 21 f2 uh but that is a bit too wide for my taste i mostly shoot street photography but when not taking family snapshots although i'm sure there are street photographers out there who make that focal length work work for them i am curious what you think of the 24s and 35s especially or the 40 millimeter although that one is kind of out of my price range many thanks hana hmm. do you want to do, do this one perry we'll start off at least uh, well, two things. Number one, the Nikkor 105 on Canon P and Roly RPX setup is sweet. Uh, I really like that film too. I think it's super underrated. And that lens balances better on that body than almost any other combo I've used. So yeah, yeah. that's a really nice pair. You know, sorry, before we talk about the Olympus stuff, one crazy thing. If you put the 105 uh, LTM on the Canon P, there's a little hot shoe uh, foot on the lens. If you if you rest the lens on like a film canister, it will balance perfectly on that with a Canon P <laughs> attached to it. Now, how how did you come? How did you figure this out, Perry? That's well, crazy. I had I had the 105 uh, on my Canon P, and I was thinking, wow, this is really well balanced. I wonder how well balanced <laughs> it is. And then I tried to kind of balance the hot shoe f- um, foot on my the tripod foot, sorry, on my uh, fingers. And it worked pretty well. So then I just put it on a film canister, and it wow, it didn't move. That's Center cool. Of gravity is right on the the. Now tripod is that now. only during the solstice, or is it like you know when you stand, you can stand an egg on end, or is it work any time of the year? I think you have to sacrifice a goat <laughs> um, if you want to do that, but otherwise it should work any time of year. And how was that goat you had last night at the Vietnamese restaurant, Perry? Uh, that goat was a goat of regret. <laughs> <laughs> don't don't eat don't eat vietnamese food from random sort of street <laughs> street restaurant places in crabby neighborhoods <laughs> yeah. uh sorry 
OM. Okay. I don't have a lot of OM lenses. Um, the the wide angle I've used for the longest time is the twenty eight three point five because it's super compact. Yeah, and it it gets the job done perfectly fine. Yeah, I I, I mean personally, I can wholeheartedly recommend the twenty four millimeter, um, the twenty four two point eight. Uh, I I have that. That's kind of my go to. If I'm shooting 24 millimeters on an SLR, that is that is my the the lens I go for. Um, the 35s are also you know very nice. Um, so either I would say either one of those is is going to work fine for the you know Hana's um, intended use. Though it's just pr- probably personal preference. The 24 is obviously quite a bit wider than the 35. So if you want a little more space. Um, you know, the 24 is definitely good and you're going to be needing to do even less focusing. Um, Mm -hmm. so if you're, you know, if you, you, if you're focused at, you know, two meters stop down and you're chasing a kid around, you're going to be probably in focus more than not. Um, and that, yeah, the 40 boy, there's a lens I would love to have, but they're just in cuckoo land price wise. (laughs) So, yeah. I mean, I've, I've, I'm going to talk not from experience, just but just from from a gas point of view. Um, the 24 and the 28 f2 uh, mm. lenses, as opposed to the 2.8. So I'd, I'd really like to get my hands on uh, on yeah. those to, to to give them a go. Just, and that's largely based on you know what I've seen of the of the. Because so I think I think there's like a, an upper range of lenses, and we talked about this before with Olympus. Um, yeah, yeah, and certainly with. Uh, my hundred millimeter f two is 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 an incredible lens, um, yeah. And I, and I think it, it applies with the other f two uh, lenses. Mm-hmm. I don't think there's anything wrong uh, with the with the two point eights at all, and they're very reasonably priced as well for for what they are. Um, yeah. Whereas the f twos are, you know, they are pretty they're pretty pricey. So it's right. I mean, I think from a from a film shooting perspective, I think the only thing you're really gaining. Uh, with the the f twos as just a brighter focusing screen yeah um and and you've got a i guess you question got a question with digital uh, whether or not you're really going to make use of that extra speed um mm-hmm. you could do but really you, are you going to be doing that many close up shots where you're going to try to get a bokeh with a twenty four millimeter lens yeah, exactly. I mean, I'm, I'm sure there are other reasons to to shoot wide open quite close to something than just getting bokeh, but there aren't many of them really so uh yeah, yeah. so well yeah. when the lens is that long um the extra stop can really help keep your shutter speeds up too yeah and actually if you got if you've got the sharpness and you've got that increased depth of field when you're using say a twenty four then you should still get a you know a, a, a reasonable amount of uh, the image is going to be still in focus even at f two. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So right. it could, it could, yeah, it, it, yeah. That makes sense. So it could get you out of trouble, really. So, uh, but you've you've obviously got the extra price and the extra weight. Um, that's, yeah. that's that's the trade off. So if, yeah. and only you know if that's 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 worth it. Um, and but, they're still relatively compact. Yeah, yeah they are relatively. Yeah, yeah. they're just ha- you know what they're con- they're. They're still compact. It's like OM stuff. They're still compact. They just get heavier. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know what I mean. They're still relatively small. They just the weight. The weight just really kind of jumps up. I bet the twenty four f two is. I'm just spitball. Is like pushing double the weight of the twenty four two eight. I'm just guessing. So yeah. I'd, it wouldn't surprise me if you're right at all. Yeah. yeah, we'll be able to balance that on a film cartridge. Not so much. Not well, so it depends much. how many goats you have. <laughs> like a like one of those balancey scales, scales of justice scales, where you have the goats on one side and the twenty four f two on the other. Yes, yeah. The more dead goats, the closer you approach justice. <laughs> on, on, on an unrelated note, uh, well, on a related note, Philip Reeves' review of the Olympus OM one hundred two point eight uh, happens to feature a few really nice photos of goats. Oh, on topic. On very much on topic. Okay, have we goaded Hana to death? Yeah, I think so. And uh, okay. so the next, the next one's from Ian Fleming. Although it's uh, addressed to Simon, Johnny, and Perry, I think this is really to you, Johnny. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, didn't we have one from? Oh, okay, we're skipping the mic. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, all right, okay. Uh, Ian Fleming says Petri Blue Scope. Now, I don't know why you guys thought this was addressed to me, but I'll I'll give it a go anyway. Uh, Simon Johnny Perry, I've ended up with a good example of one of these seemingly unloved range finders. 45 millimeter, F2.8, et cetera. What did Petri do, blue, green, et cetera? What's with the view on these cameras? Happy New Year from Ian Fleming, long-time listener and friend of the show. Ian, proper train Fleming. Is that right? Oh, this is the train in the Botanical Garden, Ian. Yes. It's a real train. It's a real real train, train. and I want a real ride on the real train. I really do. I love real trains, especially Botanic Gardens. Um, uh, The Blue Scope... Um, I don't know what to say about it. I mean, it. Uh, yeah, from it was at one point the Petri's went from uh, having the green omatic to the blue scope. So the window, the range finder frame line window is tinted blue instead of green. Um, I, I mean, I've seen them. I don't have a one of the blue style because the camera. Um, the camera design had changed quite a bit from the older cameras that had the original, you know, the original green O-Matic line evolved quite a bit by the time they were doing the blue uh, scope thing. It was the Petri seven, which is a very, very different body design, which um, uh, Carl had one of those, but I believe his was still had the green and not the blue. Yeah. Um, what's what's the we've talked about? Well, I'm not sure if we have talked about it before, but what's the deal with the green? What's so special about the green omatic? Well, it's green. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a lot of rangefinders have tinted windows to make it easier to see the contrast between the patch and the window. And so I guess do with a lot Petri, of yeah. So I guess with Petri, they just did it on the outside, so it's more obvious. Yeah. It, it's it, like my Leo. Sorry, go on. No, I was going to say. I mean, it it. it it's actually fairly ingenious, simple solution to making the frame lines and the range finder just really pop. Cause they do. I mean, the frame lines on the green omatics are freaking amazing. They're like, they're like M three level. Well, uh, I mean, let's not, let's not, let's not go that far. No, I'm serious, Perry. Like the, the, the older, the, the first line of Petri's with the green omatic, they're like M three level bright. They really are. They're oh, you mean super- the brightness of the frame lines? Yeah, and that just like the clarity uh, of the frame lines and that whole viewfinder view is really, really nice. Yeah, because um, you know, Leica's going to try to sell you an Oraco or Ocaro filter to have the same effect, right? Um, on on your Barnax, whereas like my Leotax rangefinders, what the window is blue and then the patch is tinted orange. It's just not done on the outside like the Petri. You only see it when you look right. through the, the finder. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Oh, and also, you know, if any. Um, listeners are having problems with sort of faded uh, rangefinder patches and and low contrast. There are a couple things you can do on exactly mm-hmm. this topic to increase the contrast. Like stick a piece of uh, colored like red cellophane over the yeah. rangefinder window, um, yeah. or or I mean, there's a whole bunch of tricks, but cellophane works really well. Or putting a little piece of black tape right in the middle of the yeah uh, finder to increase contrast. Mm-hmm. Yeah, works nicely. So yeah, I don't know what else to say about these other than um, I think they're really nice. I I think the the um, I I would be interested, Ian Fleming, for you to write us in and let us know how long your Petri continues to work for. <laughs> <laughs> so so just write in. We're making a note of this date. You've written us on January seventh, and we will make a note of uh, how long your your Petri continues to work for assuming that you put some film in and shoot it. So does it get through roll number one? Does it get through roll number two? How low can it go? Uh, Whenever anybody writes in talking about Petri's and they have one, they should always say I have a currently working Petri. Yes. I, I would say that is, that is a fair assessment. Okay. Um, Should we move? Yeah. Last one. On to the next. So we have Daniel Dodd uh, wrote us 
just recently to say well, it's hello. A, I was going to say that that's just it says three hours ago, but I think you're going to write seven days onto that. Seven days <laughs> from three hours ago. Okay, so Daniel Dodd wrote us seven days and three hours ago to say hello, Gear Acquisition Monkeys. Currently, wait, congratulations on reaching the 100 milestone. I bought a Takamar 83 millimeter f 1.9 recently that I plan to use on my new camera, a Minolta XD11. It was a local purchase here in Berlin, so I got a really nice price for it compared to what it goes for on eBay. Anyhow, the lens seems in good condition, but upon further inspecting in bright sunlight, I noticed there uh, that it has some tiny black spots in the rear element group. From the size, I would say these are dust. However, I've never seen dust show up as pitch black. Long story short, does just dust show up as black specks in a flashlight test, or is it something more sinister? I did some Googling, but I can't find a solid answer. Keep on keeping on, Dan. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, Johnny, you want to take this one? I guess so, sure. I, my, my first thought, especially given the age of this lens and the type of lens that it is, is that you probably have a little bit of... Uh, paint chip dust yeah. mm-hmm. that's collected there from the outer edges of the lens elements that get painted black to keep, you know, light, stray light from bouncing around inside the lens. Um, and it is not at all uncommon for that black paint to break down a little bit and you get um, literally little sp- specks of paint. And you might even tap the lens a bit and see if they move around because mm-hmm. I suspect they, they might. Yeah. Um, in any that, case, in any case, it's really not something to worry about. Other than if you were Carl, you would have specks in your bokeh, and then you would be very upset. <laughs> <laughs> and th- but that that is the point, and and it, the the issue. I mean, I, I totally that was my first thought as well. Um, yeah. the, the the really the biggest problem there is where. Um, where those specs are, and it's in, and it is at the rear of the lens. So, if you are going to be doing um, Cole Haven's bokeh type shots, yeah, then, uh, or pointing towards the light and uh, so on, then it, they may well appear. Uh, because the closer it gets to the rear element, the more likely uh, you're going to see things that are inside the lens. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So it's going to be down to the kind of shooting that you're you're going to do. But the other side of it is it's. It sounds as though it'll be relatively straightforward to actually, yeah, uh, get the, get it serviced and get it and get them blown out and uh, be done with well, it. And I was going to say, I'll, these older uh, Takamar lenses, they tend to simply sc- screw apart. Yes, I mean you can you, probably. I would just you might as well give it a shot. You're not going to hurt anything, but if you grasp the front of the lens barrel firmly. Uh, and start turning. I suspect that entire front is going to yeah. come unscrewed. Um, maybe, <laughs> maybe, but maybe not. And well, it, it <laughs> either will or it won't. Yeah, well, I mean, try it and see what happens. Yeah, well, I'd, I'll be a little bit more cautious personally. And and the reason why I, I would say that um, is is it the the thirty five two point three, the one with the bulbous front elements? Is that is that what it is? The thirty five two point three. Yeah, yeah. Um, I I had one of those that needed <clears throat> needed cleaning, and it was the rear group uh, where the where the cleaning was done. And I I took it to my repair tech, and uh, which we thought, oh, this should be pretty straightforward. You just get that cleaned out. It, who knows? It might have even been black space, black specks of paint, um, and you couldn't get you did not be you weren't able to gain access through the back, which is what we would hope that you'd be able to do. And to actually clean the clean into the the, the the inside of the rear group on that lens, everything had to be dismantled from the front of the lens. Right. And it, it, you know, you, it was literally like a it was like a treasure hunt, digging for treasure. And <laughs> it was like one bit came out, then the next bit came out, then the next bit came out, and you went all the way down to the rear group, all having to remove virtually the entire lens. Uh, an optical block to get at it so but yeah yeah, but these are a really different design like the this lens if you look at it is like so the 35 has that bulbous kind of front that uh kind of comes out a bit right yeah 
Um, whereas this is just a, the lens barrel is straight. Mm-hmm. So, and at least on the fifties, you can literally unscrew the entire optic front optical block at one go. Now here's, here's the one bit of caution is that this has a preset aperture lens. So it may, it may be a little different because you've got that preset mechanism in the front and that may or may not, uh, it, it, though it, the preset aperture is because there's ball bearings and stuff in there. You never quite know exactly how that's put together, but if the, uh, the optics in the front might just be one entire block that screws right out. Mm-hmm. So if it starts unscrewing, my, I guess my point is if you, if you can start unscrewing it, it may just lift straight out, but yes, it, <laughs> don't force it. Don't force it. And I would, I would heed Simon's word of caution that, you know, because this one is a preset aperture, it may be a little different than the others. But if it's if it's true to the fifty, then you could, in theory, unscrew the entire front optic block, and you open the aperture, and you would be seeing right into the, you know, basically the bottom group of the lens, which you could then blow out. But you know what? In any case, that it's really not going to affect anything. So I don't know. No, that I really bother. Like I would just leave it because <laughs> that's a that's a very nice lens. I mean, that's it's so nice. Yeah, and it's not cheap either. So it's the kind of lens where if you screwed it up and had to go get another one, not that I think you'd ruin it doing doing this, but still. Yeah, well, that's so, uh, for me. That's the reason for taking it to a technician that knows what they're doing yeah, specifically. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So listen, on, listen to Simon. Listen to Simon. <laughs> yeah, it's probably the prudent choice. Um, but but on this topic, uh, I mean, it is most likely in internal paint. Um, but Johnny, a while back, you also mentioned to me that there is a form of balsam separation that can show up as little tiny black, almost like flower shaped specks. Oh, yeah. But it sounds like this is different. Yeah, is this that- is probably paint. But that I have yeah. a little bit of that on one of my lenses. And it's it doesn't have an impact on the images, but it also shows up as pitch black specks. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah. So, it, it, I mean, I've got lenses that have that, but they're. I mean, they're, if you look at them closely, you it looks literally like you it, it it looks the speck will look more like a little fractal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's right. Right, as opposed, yeah. I mean, if it truly, if you like, like hold a magnifying glass up to it and it just like looks like a speck of dust but black, it's probably paint, yes, almost um, certainly. Yeah. Whereas if it looks like a flower, then a flower, that's right? Yeah, 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 exactly. This lens is so nice, though. Is it a sonar derivative? I believe it is actually. I, mm. I maybe I haven't looked at the diagram, but I believe somewhere back in my memory of looking at the old. There's that uh, that German old Takamars uh, web page that I know shows this diagram. I'll have to just pull that up and take a look. Um, but I'm I'm pretty sure that it is. Um, hold on, I got it. I'll send it into our little group. I'm just gonna pull this up right now because it's yeah. just gonna bother me. Uh, it's not ten ten Hauser. What is the you know the you know the page I'm talking about, right? Old Takamar. Yeah. yeah, it is it, it is a sonar derivative. Okay. Yeah. Seven element sonar. So there you go. Yeah. Um yeah, nice lens. Yeah, good lens. Nice, don't break it. Nice nice fi- Yeah, no, don't don't screw it up. <laughs> 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 don't mess it up. Reg- ignore anything that Johnny has said about taking that lens apart. Just ignore it. I didn't say it. You, you gotta be careful with that because you know, I used to have a uh 200 f4 takamar i think super uh, smc tack and i unscrewed the front um and it turned out that the front element and the next element kind of touched each other yeah so when you screwed it back back in suddenly there was like a speck in the middle where you could see the glass just touching each other oh i don't want that it's it's not (laughs) you know the tolerances are not right on this yeah i don't like that lens anyway but this 83 is very nice. It's yeah. sweet. I'm just, just yeah. reading what it says here. That, you know, less than a thousand of them made as well. Yeah. Th- this is why I love those old Takamars. Cause I mean, they're, they were like a lot of these lenses, they were made in very small quantities and they were, they were kind of like re-engineering them on the fly or something, you know? 
Um, but yeah, that's that's a really that's a really nice lens. Uh, and definitely worth uh, holding on to. Right. Well, I think that's probably a good place to to start to wind things down. Um, that's actually, I'm just just looking at it. It's lovely. It's a really nice lens. And I've got it's to say, really I, nice. I feel like I shouldn't say this, but it does look like the kind that you can just grab with with your hands and just unscrew the whole. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's got that Jupiter nine ish assembly shape, right? Exactly. Yeah. 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 Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, well, it, it, yeah. But go go with the proper advice and um, take it to somebody that really knows what they're doing. Um, yes. Okay. Um, right. Any shout outs this week, Perry? Uh, yeah, I got a shout out to just a couple of people who came shooting with me. So my buddy Anthony again. Uh, he has been shooting a little bit of Sinistil. He screwed up his first roll spectacularly and. Um, because he no longer trusted himself, he brought out his Canon 1V uh, with a Zeiss 5514 Otis on it to go shoot at night, and uh, I like I like the results very much. Um, I mean, it's it's he he was before he posted the pictures in the group, he was like, "Does this count as a classic lens?" I was like, "Ah, it's manual focus. It's it's fine," but it really does show sort of cine still in its most high resolution form, I guess, which is not very high. I mean, I've, I've, I've shot um, nothing quite as exotic as that, but I've used a, a Canon 1N with the Samyang 135F2, uh, which is a you know, super, super sharp combination. And, uh, I've, 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 and I think I was using 20-year exposed uh, C41 film, and, and it, it just looked, looked great. Um, I really, I, yeah. I must admit, I, I, quite, I should use that lens, that camera combination, um, more often but it's a it's a great camera yeah but there does come a point where like you i can't tell the difference between the uber sharp lenses um especially the more modern ones where people go oh the otis is sharper than the apo summicron which is as sharp as the sigma arts and i'm like that they all look the same to me (laughs) at the end of the day well yeah i mean it's it's this thing about pixel people isn't it yeah. Um, I mean, yes. I mean, and I'm, I'm I'm as guilty as this as as, as anybody. I mean, I I used to um, when I used to have versions of a lens, and I would keep a lens. Most notably, the the one that was that I've I've done the most with is probably the Jupiter Eleven, uh, because they're so notorious for sample variation. And the 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 copy that I have, um, the reason why I have it is two reasons. One, it's it's mint uh, to look at, so it's lovely and shiny. And the second is that it is the resolution on it is notably better than any one that I had previously. Um, but, uh, and yeah, I probably still stand by that actually. That That's probably a reasonable way to actually measure it. But that's, that's really comparing like with like. Um, if, I think if I was uh, saying, well, what do I want? Do I want a, a Pentacon 15 blade or do I want a, a Jupiter 11? And then judging them on their sharpness is probably not the right way to make a decision. It's, yeah. So it's I, I guess doing it that way is just ba- yeah. If you're doing like with like, then fair enough. That's a that's a reasonable way to actually do things, especially if you know the sample variation there. But if you're comparing one completely different lens to another completely different lens, then you've got to go with the overall look. Of the, you know, which one is the more pleasing to look at? Which what's the color rendition like, and all that kind of stuff, rather than the. It's almost like a tie break, isn't it? I guess, yeah. Because mm. if if ultimately the, the 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 results are very similar and the cost is similar, and you're gonna you're gonna go for one or the other, then yeah, I suppose you could do a tie break and actually say, well, which one's resolving the more, and then you go for that one, maybe. And then I'm going to rant here a little bit um, <laughs> because I, I was talking to Mike Epstein about this and he told me that, well, he was showing me some pictures with his Mamiya C330 and he was like, why do these look so good? And I was telling him that it has that kind of smooth sharpness that I really, really like. Um, and he told me that I was the second person this week who had said to him that I really don't like the Leica spherical lenses, except the with a few exceptions, because they render sharpness too harsh. And... I think the digital era has made sharpness, has elevated sharpness to an absurd level because sharp enough is good enough and it is the most quantifiable metric, right? 
And so it's easy when it comes to resolution and sharpness to get into this giant dick measuring contest. Um, like the giant on the contest, not the dick. And it just turns into a, <laughs> this dick measuring contest where it's like, okay, it, it doesn't matter beyond a certain point because you're looking at stuff on your screen or on your phone or maybe you're printing it. Um, you know, do you really need to crop 90% of your frame out? And then look at the difference. I mean, look, I, I'm going to end this rant here. I think Leica's the spherical lenses do not look nice because they are so sharp that like the picture bites you in the face when you look at it. And I find it very, very unpleasant. So to me, one of the most irritating things about the digital era is because sharpness is so damn quantifiable, people have forgotten how to look at the other qualities of lenses. And it drives me crazy. End rant. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's okay. arguing with you on that. No. 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 Okay, so yeah. any other shout outs, uh, Perry? <laughs> uh, no, I, I think uh, just a quick shout out to my girlfriend. We, she went, came out shooting with me the other day. And I, I swear she's a better street photographer than I am because she's so small and, and uh, non-threatening that she like walks right up to people in their face and starts taking <laughs> pictures of them. And then they yeah. start posing for her. <laughs> and so we we're walking around uh, the other day shooting and, you know, we got up all uh, really early to go out and I was just standing there every single time she went, she crouched down to take a picture of this little girl who was um, with uh, a bunch of her family members who were all watching her play. And then my girlfriend just walks up and starts taking pictures of this little baby girl. And the whole family comes together and starts posing around the girl for her. I was like, what? No one ever does that for me. <laughs> oh, it's Time for a sex change. <laughs> no, but but yeah, so shout outs to her. It's great to have a, a partner who likes photography and has uh, awesome stuff. As well. Yeah, that's great. So how about you, Johnny? Any any shout outs? Um, I do want to I do want to send out one uh, to Bob Matter, who uh, who I saw this week and was I, I mean, I just got to say he's a little bit under the weather. I'll leave it there. Bob can talk more if he wants to, uh, but I'm, it was good to see Bob, and I'm glad that you are uh, back up and around, Bob. That's it. Okay. Um, <laughs> I could have sworn I had a shout out, but I've already forgotten it. Um, but I think this is a, a good time to mention uh, that we've we've yet to have any entries uh, for the uh, the Malort contest or uh, win a wet on wet on wet boker. Um, Raynox lens. Not sure if that's if that prize is um, really good enough to uh, to entice people to try my lot. But um, we're we're going to run this until we actually get at least somebody entering the contest. Um, so uh, um, so yeah. So uh, to to enter that contest, all you need to do is uh, get a a taster bottle of Malort, or at least a shot of Malort. That's Jepson's Malort. No other Malort will do. And um, video yourself doing that. Uh, explain who you are. Say that you're doing it for the Classic Lenses podcast, and we'll uh, upload it uh, to our uh, YouTube page. And uh, and at some point, we will pick a winner, and uh, that winner will get a Raynox Wet on Wet Boker 135 millimeter, uh, 2.8 in M42. So uh, a pretty special lens there. Um, and actually, I have got a. Um, <laughs> A shout out, and that's to the Six Towns Dark Room, uh, where I go every Tuesday night, and uh, and everybody's welcome, and that's in Stoke on Trent. So if you want to have a go at doing some dark room stuff for free, if you come along, you, it's going to be for free. Then uh, please do. Um, we'll give you, we give you a couple of free goes, for a couple of free visits, and then we then we sting you. Um, but uh, so please uh, come come along, come on down, and uh, have a bit of fun because it's great showing people how to do it, or at least vaguely how we think how things should be done, uh, because uh, it's just good fun. Um, other thing to mention, because I get a feeling, I don't think I mentioned this last time, and that's the um, coffee donations that we had. So I'm just, I'm going to go back in time just in case um, I've missed uh, these people. So going back to the 3rd of January, uh, Lawrence Dunn, James Thorpe, Brian Walworth, 
um, have donated to us. Thank you very much. And also last week uh, came in, I think on the day we recorded, Stig of the Dump. Um, it goes, uh, I hereby confess not being a, not being a regular show, a regular listener, um, certainly in the latter half of 2019. I'm hoping for a bit more spare time in 2020, fingers crossed. And uh, well, seeing that you've uh, donated the coffee to us there, Stig, uh, we, we, we'll let you off for that. Um, and then finally, Nigel Cliff um, is... Uh, um, actually, a few when I mentioned like hardly anybody's complained about episode one hundred. Um, well, a few more people crawled out of the woodwork, including Nigel Cliff. Um, but uh, and he says here, um, hundred episode one hundred and one back on form. Um, as in, uh, he doesn't need a degree in physics uh, to understand that one. So, uh, but uh, those people that really enjoyed episode one hundred, uh, Jason will be back probably next month, and we're going to be talking about. Um, some more specific lenses so uh, it'll be an easier one to follow but it will be on YouTube so and it will be easier to follow on YouTube you have been warned so there we go um, right so Perry outside of this podcast how can people keep up with the things that you do uh, you can find me on Instagram and Flickr at Perry G or visit my never updated website at PerryG.com and Johnny um, you can catch me at Central Camera Company in Chicago most days of the week, except for uh, Monday when I'm here on the podcast and Saturday when I'm sick with a sinus infection. Okay. And how about if people want to do things with connecting with Instagram? Oh, uh, check out those guys over at uh, Best Vintage Lens. They're, they do the Instagram for us so that we don't have to. Um and they they have they have lots and lots of pictures with uh, classic lenses. Every day they post new pictures. So go go check that out and um, check out Ricardo's weekly, biweekly, occasional uh, wrap up of the the latest uh, episode of the podcast that he does. You'll you'll not want to miss that. We had we had two on the same day last uh, we a few did. days, ago, I, which really confused me. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, did he what? Did he did two at the same time, right? Or did he do two? He did, separate yeah. Ones? yeah, yeah. I think I think it was avoiding writing the one about episode one hundred for as long as he could possibly could, and then he oh, yeah. did it and thought, right, I'll do one hundred and one while I'm at it. Yeah, I think that's probably what. Yeah, yeah. sounds about right. So uh, yeah, so tag tag your photographs. Uh, Best with, vintage lens. That's yeah, it, and uh, that yep. will give you a chance of uh, being featured on their feed. Which yes, it will. Yes. Yeah. Definitely do that. Excellent. Um, we actually, I, I mentioned we've got a YouTube channel, but we've, we've actually got problems with YouTube at the moment. And then that's because the, uh, I'm going to sound technical and know what I'm talking about now, which is not true. Uh, but there are problems with the API with Podbean. That's our host. Um, and they've, they've been automatically sending things over to uh, YouTube and that fell over a couple of weeks ago. So uh, we've not actually had anything on there other than uh, what we put on there last week, which was Mike Gutterman uh, ingesting uh, Jepson's Malort. Um, and uh, that's, that's well worth watching because we talked about it last week. Well, if you, if you want to see it and you're not a member of the Negative Positives Facebook group, um, you can head over to uh, our YouTube channel, just Classic Lenses Podcast, and you will see... Um, a staggering um, um, Mike uh, Gutterman um, ingesting uh, Jefferson with Lord and then doing the rest of his face cast and uh, you can see the after effects uh, all the way through the, uh, the the face cast so uh, well well done to uh, Mike on that um, yeah indeed yeah so uh, for me I'm on Twitter as Simon4. I'm on Instagram as Simon Forster Photographic. I've got an eBay shop which if you go to our webpage uh, which is classiclensespodcast.com uh, you'll see the show notes and you can get a link to my my eBay page there. And if you buy something off me and you mentioned if you send me a message once you've bought something to say that you're listening to the Classic Lenses podcast, I will drop in there a Tunnux caramel bar which is got to be got to be worth at least mentioning that um because it's because they're great and um just just so you know i'll only put it in there if it doesn't increase the postage cost um or if i know that it will go in there without actually disintegrating and uh, wrecking whatever it is that you bought off me so uh um so there's that um i've also started selling uh 3d printed lens caps 
for exacto lenses and um, and I'm probably going to expand that into other things as well so uh, um, they're on there um, so that's that's more or less it oh, you can also hear me uh, every other week on the large format photography podcast with Andrew Bartram you can catch up with all of us in the Facebook group Classic Lenses Podcast Facebook group um, and that's just about it so uh, our music is by Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com the theme music is called Octo Blues, and that's pretty much it so I uh, hope you've enjoyed this week's show and if you can be like Carl <laughs>